पे कराया न्यास जाते श्वास जाते बूढ़ सृष्टि पे कराया न्यास जाते श्वास जाते Good evening, all. Shall we start, madam? Yes. Good evening, all. On behalf of Ruparel College, Physics Department of Ruparel College, I uh, warmly welcome you on uh, for the uh, to the dignitary of the dais on the dais and uh, my uh, and my students and all other participants. On, uh, in this meeting, in the lecture meeting. All of you are uh, welcome to attend this lecture series. Now we begin our lecture series. Uh, I 
for which I request our principal, Dr. Dilip Muske, to uh, say a few words about our college. Thank you, madam. Uh, good evening, all. First of all, on behalf of Ruparel College, I welcome you all. Today's guest, Dr. Amol Dighe from TIFR and uh, Marathi Vidyan Parishad, Desh Pandey, sir. Uh, about college, I can say college is uh, accredited by NAC three times and we have got A grade three times. The college established in 1952. Now, uh, uh, this college started in 1952 and especially science departments in Ruparel College are, uh, I can say, leading the college basically because I have proof for that. Uh, on the basis of some survey carried out by some agency last year, science faculties in Ruparel College are having uh, rank fourth rank in Maharashtra. So that is why I can say that science stream or science faculty of Rupara College is leading the college basically. Now uh, that is shown by some activities in the college that is uh, if you consider Avishkar activity that is a research activity conducted by University of Mumbai where every year our colleges are taking participating and they are going up to state level also. So many projects are were selected up to state level in Avishkar. At the same time uh, uh, physics department of our college is uh, conducting some uh, science outreach programs where uh, department teachers with some students they go to some schools and science population something like Marathi Vidyan Parishad uh, because population of science is very important for understanding and understanding in science is required for science and development so without understanding it was computer only so there should be always difference between computer and uh, we can researcher or science person. So that is basically because of understanding of science. And for that, we are doing many things, many activities in the college, like uh, lecture series, I mean, techno series, in which we have arranged some lectures based on science, science exhibitions in college, and many such activities in the college. So, uh, uh, you can say that uh, I have only two minutes. Okay. So, I thank you all, basically, uh, all the chief, all the guest speakers and uh, Marathi Vidyan Parishad for this activity because this is very important, very nice activity where we are helping uh, basic uh, understanding in science. So, once again, thank you all. Madam, you can continue. Unmuted. Uh, thank you, sir. Now I request our head of the department, uh, Professor Vidya Patil, to say a few words about our department. Namaskar, sir. Vopastitanna Adar Purvak Pranam. Uh, Maske sir has said something about the college and as well as the physics department. He is a physics faculty. And I'm just going to detail some few things. Our physics department is among the few departments which were established along with our college inception, that is way back in 1952. And the vision of our department is to provide quality education to students of physics and equip them with skills to make a change in the world of science. And to make this vision happen, along with our comprehensive teaching, we organize various co-curricular and extracurricular activities. Currently, we are conducting three add-on courses. The first one is our legacy course, the basic course in astronomy. Our department has successfully conducted this course over past 13 years. The second course is titled as Be Excellent. And to get a deeper understanding of strengths of Microsoft Excel, we have promoted this and the third one is a physics and medical sciences which covers the pattern of community spread of COVID-19 till ancient DNA. There are few more courses in pipeline 
like machine learning using Python, advanced course in astronomy, but still they are painting. We also celebrate Webchor, our multidimensional physics festival. During this festive time, we just enjoy the beauty of physics through fun with physics exhibition, students projects, mobile planetarium, lecture series, screening of sci films, it's all such things. It's a, it's a real festive mood. And I must mention here that Marathi Vidyan Parishad had always helped us by extending the financial support for such activities. We owe to society and it is our obligation to act for the benefit of society at large. We try to reach the unreached. As Muske sir has said, we try to reach to the deprived classes. We go to the rural areas of Palghar district and we enjoy the marvels of science with the barefoot students. We play with them, we enjoy with them, we do the hands-on experiments and we allow them to do that. In fact, sometimes they also teach us something exceptionally well. To go beyond the syllabus, our department organizes lectures on various topics in the arena of physics. Normally, the topics are selected on the basis of the current trends in the research, in, research and industry. This current lecture series is a subset of our techno series. And I'm sure this lecture series will also follow the legacy of successful activity. I just thank at this point for Marathi Vidyan Parishad helping us to conduct this lecture series and thank you from my end. Thank you, madam. Now I request Secretary Marathi Vidyan Parishad uh, Deshpande sir to say a few words. Hello, ma'am. Uh, ah, yes. Huh. I'm starting now. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Shubhada Vakte from Marathi Vidyan Parishad. Today is 9 February 2022. We have gathered here for the first lecture of lecture series. This lecture series is organized by Ruparel College in collaboration with Marathi Vidyan Parishad. As you know, we celebrate the National Science Day on 20th February. But Marathi Vidyan Parishad celebrates it for the whole month of February. We organize many programs for students as well as for adults. This year also we have arranged many programs and concluding program of National Science Day on 28th February or 27th February 2022. The theme of the National Science Day 2022 is integrated approach in science and technology for a sustainable future. Let us know more about National Science Day through this video of Mr. A.P. Deshpande, Secretary of Marathi Vidya Parishad. Let me share this video. The first National Science Day was celebrated. Hassan Gowarikar was the Secretary of the Department of Science and Technology in New Delhi during 1986 to 91. He started many activities in DST during his regime. One among them was celebrating National Science Day. This day should be selected to celebrate National Science Day was being discussed then in DST. First they thought of having 2nd October, that is Mahatma Gandhi's birthday, or else 14th November, that is Pandit Nehru's birthday. But then they discovered that there are many programs throughout the country to celebrate such occasions. And so National Science Day should be deferred from these dates. Then they found out that 28 February was the day when Dr. C. V. Raman submitted his famous essay to the world-known science magazine Nature. And this particular essay led him to get the Nobel Prize in 1930. So that is how 28 February was fixed up as the National Science Day. Everyone was doubting whether it will pick up 
and create the atmosphere of science in the country. But then the order was given to the government organizations throughout the country to keep their establishments open for the people to visit. And that is how it started picking up. Then schools and colleges participated into it. And now we find that there are many competitions and programs that are being organized on such a day, like competitions, lectures, discussions, seminars, visits, uh, experiments, and all that. I find that in uh, Ayuka, Pune, Dr. Jain Narayakar, he organizes the lectures. He himself delivers the lecture. Many other scientists from Ayuka also deliver the lectures. Then they take them around the institution to show what activities are going on there. And uh, few games are there. Uh, so that is how one institution, Ayuka, celebrates similarly. There are many other institutions which are kept open to show to the visitors uh, and create the atmosphere of science. So, uh, such opportunities should be used among the students of the colleges and schools to provoke them to go for the science trip, carry out the research and do it as a uh, profession. Uh, because it is the science and technology alone which can bring prosperity to any country. And this particular thing has been proved by China, Korea, Singapore and many other countries that by use of science and technology, countries can prosper. So let us celebrate the National Science Day from this particular angle. Thank you. Thank you, sir. From this introduction, we can say that it is necessary to celebrate National Science Day throughout whole year to develop scientific, uh, scientific temper in society. Thank you, sir, again. Marathi Vidyan Parishad organizes variety of activities for people of all age groups and socio-economic backgrounds. To carry out these activities, Marathi Vidyan Parishad needs volunteers. We are proud to say that Ruparil students assist us whenever we need it. It is not only helpful, but we have always noticed the quality in it. Here are some other programs. Shaniwari Vidyanwari is a popular program, but in Corona pandemic, since last two years, it was not conducted. In the year 2018 and 19, Ruparel college students were participated in Shaniwar, Shaniwari Vidnanwari. Let us some these photos. Yeah, your names are also written. Oh, Avindra Shigwan. Now these uh, students are performing experiments in front of students first they get uh, they got training of all these how to do experiments and then they are supposed to perform all these experiments in front of the students priya Christo and sara debro so college mein pen kya hai usko bolna sa aur reta na sa rally mein Snehal, Haldankar and Himani Patil. Which we won't tell you in this time, my mind means my mind is not going to be. Now in this picture you can say that students are also happy with these college volunteers. Yes, now here is next program that is Dementia. Uh, Marathi Vidyan Parishad organizes lectures on different topics. Dementia is uh, one topic here. Uh, Vismaran. Now these lectures are held on 13th and 20th February. Uh, Mr. 
सॉरी डॉक्टर मंगला जोगेकर द हेड ऑफ मंगेशकर हॉस्पिटल स्मृती चिकित्सालय विल डिलिव्हर दिस लेक्चर्स दिस इम्पॉर्टंट टॉपिक विल बी कव्हर्ड इन टू सेशन द फर्स्ट सेशन ऑन थर्टीन अँड सेकंड ऑन ट्वेंटी फेब्रुवारी टायमिंग इज फाईव्ह टू सिक्स ऑन बोथ डेज बट दिस दिस बोथ लेक्चर्स आर इन मराठी नाव दिस लेक्चर्स आर ओपन टू ऑल विदाउट एनी फी नाव नेक्स्ट दॅट इज पक्षी निरीक्षण ओळख बर्ड वॉचिंग पोल्स नाव ऑन नाईन्टीन अँड ट्वेंटी फेब्रुवारी अ बर्ड वॉचिंग पोल्स विल बी हेड दिस प्रोग्राम इज अवेलेबल इन मराठी हिंदी अँड इंग्लिश एनी वन अबाव फिफ्टीन इयर्स इज एलिजिबल टू पार्टिसिपेट इट हो देन मराठी विज्ञान परिषद मंथली मॅगझिन इज इन दिस आर्टिकल्स बेस्ड ऑन करंट इशूज आर पब्लिश द मॅगझिन इज फॉर स्टुडंट्स अँड पीपल ऑफ ऑल ग्रुप्स हार्ड कॉपी ॲज वेल ॲज सॉफ्ट कॉपी ऑल्सो अवेलेबल बी अ मेंबर ऑफ पत्रिका नाव नेक्स्ट देअर इज शहरी शेती ओळख वर्ग दॅट इज सिटी फार्मिंग सेशन सॉलिड वेस्ट मॅनेजमेंट इज अ बिग प्रॉब्लेम फॉर अ डेज वन ऑफ वे आउट इज टू ॲडॉप्ट सिटी फार्मिंग टेक्निक दिस टेक्स केअर ऑफ बायो डिग्रेडेबल वेस्ट जनरेटेड इन द हाऊस विच इज अबाउट फॉर्टी फाईव्ह पर्सेंट ऑफ द टोटल सॉलिड वेस्ट सिटी फार्मिंग टेक्निक युजेस दिस वेस्ट गेनफुल्ली अँड प्रोड्युसेस सीझनल फ्रुट्स अँड व्हेजिटेबल्स मिस्टर दिलीप हेर्लेकर कंडक्ट द सेशन ऑन एव्हरी फर्स्ट संडे ऑफ द मंथ फॉर मोर इन्फॉर्मेशन प्लीज व्हेज व्हिजिट अवर वेबसाईट डब्ल्यू डब्ल्यू डॉट मवीप डॉट ओ आर जी अँड लाईक अवर फेसबुक and subscribe our youtube channel thank you over to dama thank you madam uh, for uh, nice information about marathi vidyan parishad to all now let us begin with uh, our uh, first lecture uh, in this lecture series i request our uh, professor sumit savant sir to introduce our today's chief guest or guest speaker uh, Uh, professor amol dighe so over to you uh, sumit sir thank you mukda ma'am uh, my fascination with physics started when i read the book title akasha shi jalde nate by dr jayant narikar dr narikar needs no introduction we all know him as a topmost cosmologist and a prolific writer but when you think about the other end of the spectrum that is the science of elementary particles we have dr amol dighe those who have studied particle physics would agree with me when i say he is the sydney coleman of indian scientific community with an additional quality of being interested in science popularization and we are we are fortunate to have have him with us today and it's my pleasure to introduce him dr amol dighe is a professor of physics in tata institute of fundamental research in the Deta department of theoretical physics he works in the area of high energy physics which aims to understand the nature of fundamental interaction by studying properties of elementary particles his recent research has focused on the physics uh, on the particles known as neutrinos their nature and the role they play in astrophysics as well as cosmology he looks for the sign of the new physics at experiments like large hadron collider which we know as lhc and the particles that come from the sky that is cosmic particles or cosmic rays He completed his B.Tech in Engineering Physics in 1992 from IIT B, that is IIT Bombay. His M.S. and Ph.D. in 1997 from University of Chicago, where he explored the signals of charge parity violation in particle physics interactions. Later, he was postdoctoral researcher in ICTP, Trieste, Italy, CERN, Geneva, Switzerland, and Max Planck Institute of physics munich germany later he joined tifr as a faculty member in 
He was one of the first Indian bronze medalist in International Mathematics Olympiad held in Germany in 1989. He has received the Institute Silver Medal from IIT Bombay and World Lab Sun John World Lab Sun John Bell Scholarship. He was the leader of the Max Planck India Partner Group in Neutrino Physics and Astrophysics for five years. He has been elected Fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences and the Indian National Science Academy. He was he has won the Swarna Jayanti Fellowship from the Department of Science and Technology and is the recipient of Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award. He has been awarded the Distinguished Alumni Award of IIT Bombay. Apart from his scientific publication, Dr. Dige has also numerous, uh, written numerous popular science articles in newspapers and magazines. I must also mention that he is a Rural College alumni. This is very proud moment for us to have him he, uh, with us here again. So without much further delay, I invite Dr. Dige, Dige to deliver his talk on recent advances in physics research. research. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Over to you, sir. So thanks for that uh, nice introduction. Um, let me try to share my slides and just let me know if uh, you can hear me well. Uh, can you see my slides? Hello. No, not yet. Not yet. No, okay, just one second then. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, thanks uh, to uh, Marathi Vijayan Parishad and Rupal College for giving me a chance to speak uh, in this lecture series on National Science Day. Uh, so, when Lokte uh, Madam contacted me, uh, she told me to talk about some recent advances in, in physics research. Uh, it's actually quite difficult to pick up a few things from the vast amount of things that are going on in, uh, in physics research everywhere. But what I did is I tried to pick five of my favorites uh, that have come from uh, uh, maybe new results in the last two, three, or uh, four years. Um, I try to pick up these things, which of course is something that fascinate me. Uh, that is something about which I can you know, say something interesting, uh, but also something that uh, go back to some fundamental principles in physics. So as you see these five pictures, which will come to slowly when I go through my talk, you will notice that they in, indeed look very different from each other. In the Greek mythology, there is this concept of Auroboros, which is a snake which eats its own tail. Uh, this is also there on the thing in Ayuka, this is on the wall. Uh, as far as physics is concerned, uh, this snake eating its tail represents that science can be done at many, many different scales. Uh, at the bottom, you will see the human scale, uh, which is about one meter or so. As you go to uh, finer and finer scales at 10 power minus 5 centimeters you come to maybe the cells then 10 power minus 10 centimeters is where you come to atoms 10 power minus 15 is when you come to nuclei and 10 power minus 20 is a scale where we haven't reached yet if you start going in the opposite directions uh, you will of course get mountains and earth at you no know, 10 power 10 13 centimeters it's a solar system um, and perhaps the galaxies and, and so on. It so turns out that the physics that happens at the scale of galaxies, which is 10 power minus 25 centimeters or so, can actually be understood by trying to see what happens at the opposite end of the scale, which is 10 power minus 20 centimeters. So the snake of physics actually is eating its tail in the sense to understand what's happening in the brain of the, uh, the snake, so to say, the tail of the snake, which is elementary particles, actually helps. So that is the interdependence of uh, astrophysics, cosmology, and particle physics. 
And many of the things that I'll be talking about today actually have to do with those experiments that actually combine elementary particles as well as very large scale uh, events happening in the cosmos at the level of stars or galaxies and so on. Okay. So the common thread behind all the five things I talk about is that these results connect many, many different scales throughout this region, starting all the way from 10 power minus 20 centimeters coming to meters and going all the way to almost 10 power 25 centimeters. The first thing I will talk about is the precision measurement of Planck's constant. Okay, so all of us know that Planck constant actually plays a fundamental role in quantum mechanics, which explains things at very, very tiny scales. However, what I'm going to point out is that this actually will play a very pivotal role in our very, very daily life. And this comes when we talk about our measurement units. Now we know that uh, so we have the standard SI units, which are second, uh, meter, kilogram, mole, ampere, Kelvin, you know, candela. Uh, these things we can uh, have in our textbooks, even of let's say 11th and 12th standard. We also know how these units are defined because we have to define them in order to do measurements for any further physical quantity. So, for example, uh, for second, what we do is we take the cesium 133 atom, we look at a particular transition between these two energy levels, and we say that uh, 9 well, billion, 192 billion, and so on, exactly these many periods of the radiation that corresponds to this transition is our one second. Now, this is a very, very precise definition. And in fact, this is known to almost 13 decimal places. After that, we define meter, which is the distance traveled by light in vacuum in exactly one divided by about 292.99 billion seconds. Then we have our kilogram, which uh, is defined in terms of carbon 12, but practically speaking, you have a, a prototype kilogram which used to be kept in Paris, and based on that, you would determine what our kilograms are. Uh, we have Kelvin, and the Kelvin is something we define in terms of the temperature of the triple point of water, uh, which is basically very close to zero degrees Celsius, and we say that one upon two seventy three point one six of this temperature is uh, one Kelvin. And then we have uh, ampere, and that has to do with parallel conductors and attractive force between them. Well, the definitions are okay, but still not ideal enough. And the reason is because it is very, very difficult to keep uh, a meter scale, which is you know, uh, exact a prototype. It's very, very difficult to maintain uh, a kilogram which is you no know, one unit kept in some vault in Paris. It is very difficult to define the triple point of water exactly. And again, it's very difficult to measure force to this much accuracy. Therefore, meteorologists had tried to propose that we should define units in a very different way. And in fact, as a result, the definitions of all the SI units, and most of them have changed or have been changed in the last two years. What is the principle that we use? The principle that we use is the following. Remember that meter was defined as a distance traveled by light in vacuum in these many seconds. In other words, we can define it as that distance in terms of which the speed of light is exactly this 2997924.5 meters per second. The way to look at it is the following. Suppose I change the length of my actual meter by a small amount, then of course this number will change. Therefore, for a very precise length that I choose as one meter, is the speed of light equal to this? Now this principle at this point looks as a very vague principle, but you will find now that this principle will help us define units in a very precise way and a way that will be everlasting. What are the principles? The principle is the following. This is what is now called as a new philosophy of units. So what you do, what you did here is you chose 
a fundamental constant of nature that connected time and distance. Then you measure this value, which is the speed of light, as accurately as possible. When you knew it to a very great accuracy, you freeze its value. Okay. So now onwards, we decide that the speed of light's value will be constant and will not change, will be exactly equal to this. Now, from this value, you define the meter. Okay. You already knew what a second was, and now you exactly know what a meter was. Now you know that this definition of meter did not need you to give me a length scale and say, this is my, uh, my meter. All you needed was to know that C, which is speed of light, has exactly this value. The same concept will now henceforth be used to define all the other units. So for example, the first such unit happened to be kilogram. Now we know that Planck's constant has units of kilogram meter square per second. We have already defined second and meter. Therefore, we can define unit of mass as so as that unit in which the value of Planck constant is exactly this one. Now, if you want to freeze such a value, the first thing you need to do is measure this edge very precisely using today's units. And that is where the earlier figure that I showed you comes into play. The instrument that I showed you some time back, which was here, is called as the water balance or the cable balance. It's called as water balance because this, in this kind of uh, balance, see normally what you do, normally we balance force of gravity, mg, with another force of gravity, mg, in the balance. This is the balance in which the force of gravity, mg, is actually balanced by electricity. Okay? Because when current passes through wires, we know that it produces magnetic field. Magnetic field and electric field can offer force on each other. And using this principle, one can actually balance a force of uh, gravity on a mass of mg, an opposing force which depends on the magnetic field, the length of the wire, and the current. Is there a question? No, sir, I don't think there is any question. Okay. So, where does Planck constant appear here? It turns out that if you really want to measure magnetic field and current very, very precisely, the best methods available to us right now is the measurement of what is called as Josephson voltage and what is called as fractional quantum Hall effect. Okay, so I don't know if these are available uh, experiments to you in your college, but at some point of time, it is important for you to know of these two phenomena, which tell you how to measure Planck's constant using these. So therefore now our Planck's constant is fixed. This is the reason that we wanted to measure Planck's constant to almost 10 decimal places. But once that is done, then of course we are in business. So our new system of units now has been defined, not in terms of any instruments or any kind of uh, prototype that have been kept, but in terms of constants of nature, Avogadro's number, Planck's constant, Boltzmann constant, speed of light, and elementary charge. So, for example, speed of light we saw in terms of uh, the meter is defined in terms of speed of light, kilogram in terms of Planck's constant, the mole in terms of Avogadro's constant, temperature Kelvin in terms of Boltzmann constant, and current ampere in terms of the charge of electron. So this now has given us a new way of looking at SI system and that actually needed measurement of Planck's constant and that's why it was the first thing that uh, I presented. India actually has a Planck's constant uh, measuring instrument. Uh, it is the one gram cable balance. It is kept right now in New Delhi National Physical Laboratory. However, nice thing is that this cable balance can be designed by us given enough expertise in our own lab. Uh, since this is organized by Marathi Vidyan Parishad, I actually want to point out that Marathi Vidyan Parishad bring, brought out this uh, book, which tells you about, uh, about this new system of units. The second uh, discovery that I will go to is the discovery of gravitational waves. 
So what happens here? They have got two very, very large objects. No? They can be black holes, for example, which can have masses of maybe up to 50 times the mass of the sun. If two of these are very close to each other, they can actually start going around each other. When they do that, they actually change the space time around them. And as a result, gravitational waves come out. This was a prediction given by Einstein's theory of relativity, general theory of relativity. Measurement of this is made by instrument that look like this. These two arms of the instrument each have a length of four kilometers. So they're really, really long. This is the LIGO observatory in the USA. Now, along these two arms, laser beams can go back and forth. Okay. So you use interference, which means that you check whether the length of these two arms is always the same or not. Now, when the gravitational wave will pass, gravitational wave changes lengths. So when a gravitational wave passes, the length of these two arms will change slightly. Okay. And the interferometer, which is uh, based all across these eight kilometers, will tell you if this length has changed or not. This is a very, very precise precision uh, experiment. Measurement is needed to be very, very precise, but it was done. Okay. And in fact, what was observed was when two black holes go around them and start coming closer and closer together, the frequency of rotation of their movement is the same as the frequency of the gravitational wave. And you can observe this frequency and you see that as they start, come, start, start coming closer and closer, they start moving faster and faster. As a result, the frequency of the oscillations increases and at some point of time they merge together when the frequency reaches its peak and finally they convert into just one black hole. So this phenomenon of merger of two black holes to form the simple black hole releases energy which is more than the energy corresponding to masses of a few suns, a really, really large energy. And this can be observed at gravitational inverted techniques. In the last few years, many of these mergers have actually been found, which mainly were mergers of black holes. But something else happened two or three years ago, which is what I want to point out, which is that the merger of neutron stars was seen. Now, the reason that this small event is very significant is the following. See, from black holes, normally, no light comes out. However, when neutron stars merge, actually light comes out. And it means that we can actually see what is coming out of neutron stars or what elements have been produced. It was so found that really, really heavy elements in the periodic table were produced in the merger of these neutron stars. As a result, we now understand our periodic table much better. If you see this periodic table, in addition to giving the names of elements, it also tells you where they were produced. So for example, some of them were produced at the Big Bang, which are hydrogen and helium, perhaps some lithium. Many of these greenish ones that you see were produced in exploding massive stars like supernovae. However, what we find now is most of the heavy elements actually were produced when neutron stars merged. So just this single event of merging of neutron stars has told us that most likely all the heavy elements above atomic number of maybe 40 or so were actually produced in merging neutron stars. So the gravitational waves, which is something that happens at a very large scale, actually has told us about exactly how elements were formed, which is actually you know, happening at very, very small scale. This is one very prominent example where large scale phenomena have told us how our nuclei actually happened. So this is a, a very major. Uh, India is going to play a major role in the gravitational wave detection over the last next few decades. Okay. The plan is to have a detector called LIGO India uh, which is again going to be a four kilometer each arm interferometer and it is being uh, led by these agencies. The site is chosen, happens to be in Maharashtra in the district of Hingoli. And you see here a photo of the site. So right now it is just a fence, but inside this fence, the next decade or so, 
this major mega project is going to be set up. And you know, those of you who are interested in this will get opportunity to work on, on this mega project right in our state. The third example I will go to is the measurement of the magnetic moment of muon. So what is muon? Yeah, muon is a papasuvia particle which is exactly like electron but slightly heavier. That's all. This is the instrumented Fermi lab that measured this magnetic moment. So what is the magnetic moment and what is you know, so big about this? Uh, this is a nice cartoon which tells us about what is called as the spin of an electron, which perhaps you have learned in uh, your physics classes. Okay. Um, it says that electron spin uh, can be explained by imagining a small ball that's rotating, except that it's not a ball and it's not rotating. Uh, <laughs> this looks very counterintuitive, but that's exactly the way this functions. The reason it's like this is because electron spin is a purely quantum phenomenon. What does this mean? that you cannot simply cannot explain it by using classical concepts of ball, rotation and so on and so forth. It happens to be a property of an electron which uh, it's observed to obey. So mathematically speaking, it, it behaves like angular momentum or if you can say it behaves like a magnetic moment. However, actually it is very, very different because the standard magnetic moment corresponds to g equal to 2, which tells you how big the magnetic moment is compared to the angular momentum. Okay. The classically, the value is 1. Quantum mechanically, the value is 2. Okay. Again, I will not go into the details of this, but quantum mechanically, we can actually understand why the magnetic moment can be characterized by the value of g is equal to 2. In quantum mechanics, how do you understand this? Where does magnetic moment come from? We say, ah, okay, so magnetic moment is something which when it's kept in the magnetic field goes around the magnetic field. Okay. This is called as precession. So a magnetic field applies torque on the magnetic moment so that the magnetic moment can precess around this magnetic field. This precession happens with a particular frequency which is called as the Darmer frequency. Uh, some of you might have heard about the Darmer frequency. If you measure this frequency, then you can measure the value of G, okay, which is the value of uh, the magnetic moment. Why is it so big deal that we want to work about, you know, about measure the magnetic moment? The reason is that magnetic moment tells us something more than simply the spin of this particle. Many of the things that I will say might only sound like jargon, but the reason I want to mention it in front of uh, the BAC students of Ruparel, because perhaps these words inspire you to go back and look at actually what, what these words mean and what these phenomena are. We understand a magnetic moment as interaction of electron or any charged particle with an external photon. This photon comes from the magnetic field. When an electron interacts with external photon, what we see is a magnetic moment. And this, if you calculate, tells you that the value of g is equal to 2. You can imagine this as an electron traveling from left to right, interacting with the photon, and giving you a particular value of g for the magnetic moment. Now comes the real interesting stuff. Now we know that the world is not obeyed. It does not follow quantum mechanics exactly. What the world follows is what is called as quantum field change. What does this mean? This means that everything that you see around you is not just simple particles. What happens is the whole world around us is filled by, is filled by what are called as quantum fields. And what we see as particles are simply fluctuations in these fields. So many of the fluctuations are real fluctuations, in which case you observe them directly. However, many of them are not real fluctuations. In quantum mechanics, remember we talk about uncertainty relation, delta E and delta T is equal to H, which means that conservation of energy 
can be broken for a very, very short time t at the physics limits in time. This allows you to create and destroy particles in that cube as long as that happens for a very, very short time. So, if you look at vacuum, vacuum does not mean that there is complete blank. Vacuum actually means that particles keep on getting formed, created, and destroyed. So, vacuum actually is, is a big uh, quantum dance of particles. We call that almost like a tandem of particles. Now, these particles actually can interact with your electron which is moving in space. And interactions of these particles with the electron can actually be detected through magnetic moment. And that's the reason magnetic moment is very, very important. Okay. So for example, you know, what happens is, I showed you this diagram in which electron combines with a photon, giving you magnetic moment G equal to two. However, it's possible that this same electron also emits another photon, which is reabsorbed again. It's a complicated process, but it happens. And the evidence that it happens comes from the fact that this process changes the value of magnetic moment by a factor of about 1 upon 137 pi, so almost 1 by 1000. But you can measure this 1 by 1000. And this tells you that indeed in vacuum, there are lots of photons they're always getting formed and getting absorbed. So measurement of magnetic moment tells us something more about what a vacuum is. This understanding of vacuum is something which is much more fundamental than what we are doing. That's why this measurement is crucial. So this was photon forming and destroying. What about other particles? And indeed it so happens that this process is influenced by many, many more things okay, from what is what it, interchange of photons, interchange of neutrinos, interchange of W or Z bosons, interchange of uh, protons, neutrons, and various different hadrons. And all of these things actually affect the value of magnetic moment. And therefore, when we make a precise measurement of magnetic moment, we understand more about what our vacuum consists of. And that is the reason that I think of this measurement of magnetic moment as understanding our vacuum or our quantum vacuum in a much more real sense. What people do is all of this complicated thing that I showed about, they write this as a G minus two, which means that from the magnetic moment, two comes from simple quantum mechanics and G minus two comes from quantum vacuum. The value of G minus 2 for electron has been measured to, I think, almost 12 or 13 decimal places. And the value which is calculated and the value which is measured agree exactly precisely. In, I think, the whole of science, this happens to be one measurement that is accurate, the accuracy between experiment and theory has been measured to 12 decimal places. And that tells us that our understanding of quantum vacuum is actually very, very accurate. However, as scientists, we should not uh, you know, be content with what we have measured, but go slightly further. And therefore, we go to measure the magnetic moment of muon, which is exactly like electron. So we see, is the vacuum measured by muon the same as vacuum measured by electron? And we know it should be the same. So muon happens to be 200 times heavier than electron, and it decays to electron within about two microseconds or so. So we have to make a measurement very, very quickly. Okay. Electron can be there for a very long time, not muon. Uh, again, Indian connection is that Hobi Bhava, who actually established TIFR, was the first one to identify this in cosmic rays and call this muon as, as a heavy electron. Okay. Now, of course, we know it, it very, very well. So as I mentioned, measurement of this value of G of a muon is going to be a test of nature of quantum vacuum. So in Fermi lab recently, an experiment was done in which muons were passed in the ring. So they keep on rotating, going around the circle inside the ring. But if you notice while they are going around, this triangle that represents their spin is also precessing about 
uh, is uh, direction of motion, right? That's because there is a magnetic field inside this ring. Now, when these muons go around, at some point they decay to electrons. The detector, which can measure number of electrons coming in. Let's not go into details of the experiment. Suffice it to say that this actually measured the value of magnetic moment of uh, muon accurate to nine decimal places. And it so happened that these two values measured by experimental theory match not to nine decimal places. They actually were matched to six decimal places, oh, sorry, seven of them, and did not match to the eight. Now, somebody might say that, oh, uh, well, no, we have something which is accurate to seven decimal places. Why do you worry about eight? Could be an error. However, when we try doing very, very precise measurements, even an error coming at nine decimal places is something that we have to be really, really careful about. Indeed, what people have found is that experimental results that are shown by this uh, purple band and calculations, standard model, which are shown by this green band, differ by almost 4.2 sigma, which means that the possibility of them being the same statistically is less than about 1 in 10,000. At this point of time, this tells you that the nature of quantum vacuum as we understand it would be slightly different from what we understand now. It could be because there are new particles and it could be because there are some new interactions. This gives us an impetus to try to go to elementary particles and try to see exactly uh, what uh, could be missing. Okay. So the reason I told you about this slightly technical topic is because this perhaps tells us that uh, we should understand something more about elementary particle physics, which may be missing. Okay. I'll go to my fourth topic, which is photographing a black hole. And this actually looks very, very uh, counterintuitive because black holes are black, which means no light comes out of them. What do you mean photographing a black hole? So of course you don't photograph a black hole. What you try to look for is material around the black hole which has not yet been absorbed by the black hole. This material exists around the black hole because it keeps on going around the black hole with a very, very large speed and its angular momentum keeps it from being falling inside the black hole. So this material is called as accretion disk. This accretion disk has lots of charged particles. So when they go around this black hole, these charged particles emit radio waves. These radio waves can be detected by radio telescopes, which are all around the world. Radio telescopes in uh, these various locations that you see uh, on the Earth, they form a network. This network is called as the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration, or EHT. This Event Horizon Telescope actually tried to look at the same place for a very, very long time combined their measurements, and as a combination, gave you this picture of black hole. So what you see is actually not a photo of the black hole. It's not that there are red things going around the black hole. It's a representation, an artist representation. However, it has science in it in the sense it knows from where radio waves are coming and from where they are not coming. So this was the first picture, which was uh, actually given by this uh, event for other telescope in April 2019. This was near the center of the galaxy for M87. Uh, this is uh, a very, very large black hole. Uh, I think of more than about 10 power uh, 9 solar masses, if I'm not wrong. And you see that this black circle shows you that at the center there is a black hole because no light is coming from it. And around that is the accretion disk. What we see as red here, is not actually red, these are radio waves, just represent very different colors. Now, what is this black circle you see here? At first glance, you might think that, oh, this looks like the black hole, so my black hole must have this size that you see here. And the answer actually is no. What you see here is not the black hole, only the part of it is black. A black hole, it has a mass M, has a radius 
of about m and therefore diameter of about two times m. So if it was just this black hole, it would have a diameter of 2m. But that is not that is not what we see because that's only the basic uh, black hole. You can still go around the black hole and not be not be able to come out. And this uh, red region here, which has diameter of 3m, is called as the photosphere, and photons even inside this cannot come out. But going on top of that. General theory of relativity tells you that light bends around a black hole. And therefore, light which is coming out from here is not one that comes to us in these straight lines, but comes curved like this. As a result, the radius that we should see of this dark patch should be 3 root 3 times the mass of the black hole. And in fact, that is what was observed. And therefore, this was also one of the great tests of the general theory of relativity, which tells you how much light bends. So observation of this black hole told us something more than uh, just the fact that a black hole exists. It actually also told us that general theory of relativity is actually exact. You observe this dark patch to be 3 root 3 times m and not simply equal to 2 times. This was in 2019. Just last year, we did something more, which was people actually tried to look at the polarization of these radio waves and therefore figured out the magnetic field around this black hole. And that gives rise to this picture that you see. So now we can actually see how magnetic field around a black hole works. And this is therefore going to allow us to go deeper and figure out how uh, things work around a black hole. Okay, so this collaboration is just getting started. Right now we have observed only one black hole, but we hope that many more black holes will be actually in course photographed and we can study the magnetic field going around this and therefore phenomena that happen at very, very large gravitational fields, okay, which of course we cannot see. Before. The last of my, my favorite experiment that I have chosen is when we saw a blazer before it blazed. So what does this mean? Let me come to that. But before that, let me tell you of a very interesting experiment that is happening at the South Pole. Okay. So this actually is the South Pole. And this is the science station, which is almost exactly on top of South Pole. So what is this experiment? This experiment is called as Ice Cube. And it literally is the largest cube of ice that we have ever, ever seen. So this top that you see here is the land. And below that, this region that you see is actually exactly below South Pole. So this point that you see here is approximately the South Pole. And this small thing that you see is the lab that I showed you in the earlier slide. So what is this below? What is this below is actually ice. So very, very big slab of ice. You note that the depth is almost 2,800 meters. For comparison, you see the Eiffel Tower. So what scientists have done is they have used this ice as a big detector. So what they do is the detectors are optical detectors. So these are strings to which they are attached. So what is done is you make a small hole on top. You literally put boiling water so that ice melts. And then you lower these strings one by one very, very slowly inside the ice. So top part is just strings, but the bottom part here that you see this dark part consists of lots of optical detectors, which can detect, which can measure light. Now what happens? If a particle like a neutrino, which is very, very hard to detect, enters the detector, sometimes this produces what is called as a muon, which is what we saw earlier. Now this muon, if it enters, uh, ice, sometimes it travels faster than the speed of light in ice. Of course, in light, light of the speed of light is smaller in ice, right? But a muon can travel faster than the speed of light in ice. As a result, it produces what is called a Cherenkov light. And this Cherenkov light is detected by all these tiny photodetectors that you see here. And therefore, you can observe 
very very high energy neutrino coming from some astrophysical phenomenon. So, for example, one such phenomenon is called as a blazer, which is uh, essentially something happening at the center of a very large galaxy. Uh, blazers start blazing or giving out uh, signals uh, without any warning, so to say. We do not know when a blazer is going to start giving you X-rays and gamma rays and so on. But before it starts giving X-rays and gamma rays, it gives out particles called as neutrinos. These neutrinos come out of this. They can be detected at a detector like Ice Cube that I showed you earlier. It's basically a neutrino detector. If you see where the neutrino came from, the fact that it's a very high energy, it tells you that something is happening in this part of the sky. Then all the other detectors that we have, which you can X rays and gamma rays, can actually start looking in that direction, seeing what's happening. And once this blazer starts blazing, you can actually see it blazing. So you can get a forewarning of something that's going to happen in some part of the sky. Suddenly something is going to flare up. That's exactly what happened in this case. A neutrino came. It was seen in Ice Cube. It was seen on this day, 170922, that's 22nd of September 2017. When neutrino was observed in Ice Cube, other detectors, which were detectors made of X-rays and gamma rays, started looking in that direction. And slowly, when the blazer started blazing, we actually started seeing uh, uh, these are. This is a, a swift, which is a satellite. This is Fermi satellite. This is a X-ray detector on Earth. All of these detectors that you are seeing here around the Earth and on Earth started seeing this blazer. So this blazer, which would otherwise have gone missing, was discovered because we knew it was going to occur a few days in advance. So neutrino was found in September 22. Uh, gamma rays were found well, discovered in September 26. X-rays on September 28, and so on and so forth. When you see an object in different frequencies, it tells you about different phenomena happening in that object. And therefore, it's very important to look at objects in, uh, uh, with different kind of eyes. This is what we call as looking at the universe with multiple eyes. So this is, for example, what happens if you look at our universe in the, at different wavelengths. So radio waves show us universe like this, infrared shows this, X-ray shows this, visible shows this, gamma rays shows this, and so on. Neutrinos that we started observing very recently, one of them was the event that I showed you, have also started showing various events. Gravitational waves that we saw in the last few years have also started showing us some. So ideal thing would be to be able to observe some events from neutrinos, from light, and from gravitational waves. And this one is called as multi messenger astronomy. It's again going to be a branch of physics that's going to be you know, come up in the next uh, decade or so. Many of you who would want to be a part of this would have chances of actually working in, with multi messenger astronomy. India is a part of this. We are going to build what is called the India based neutrino observatory or INO. Currently, it is planned to be under this uh, big, uh, big set of rock about. 100 meters high, uh, looking at atmospheric neutrinos. Uh, it can separate neutrino and antineutrino, look at dark matter, look at Earth, and, and so on and so forth. Okay. Unfortunately, time is short for me for, to describe, uh, describe all these things. Maybe some other time when we have a longer time to, to discuss at leisure and perhaps also in person. This is my last slide, and I want to somehow combine all of these experiments and all of these results to talk about what do we understand from all these things that uh, sometimes look quite unrelated to what we are doing in daily life. But note that everything that we do finally emerges from four fundamental forces. Gravity, electromagnetism, strong forces, and weak forces. And really, if you want to understand these forces, you want to understand how things, how these forces interact amongst each other 
And what happens to freedom you know, that involves more than these, more than one of these forces? These five things I talked about are good examples of this. So, for example, gravity plays a very big role in uh, black holes and in uh, mergers of black holes and stars. Electromagnetism plays a big role in the accretion disk, magnetic field, in the skimmel or water balance, in magnetic moments, and also in the detection of X rays and gamma. Strong nuclear force is something that actually makes new elements. Uh, it also plays a part in uh, this uh, quantum vacuum, which uh, affects the magnetic moment. And weak nuclear force affects magnetic moment, uh, is the one that causes interaction of neutrinos, and in fact also creates these heavy elements. So this is to show that although we do physics in many different labs, in many different ways, finally all boils down to these four forces, and that is what uh, unifies us, and that is what interests us, or at least me in physics. So I want to leave you with this thought, and uh, maybe if there are any more questions, uh, we can take them at this point. So, students, so if you have any question, you can ask right now, sir. Or uh, you can uh, type it in the chat box. I think we should give them some time to type it out. Yeah, so I can I can see some questions. So uh, let me just uh, start answering that maybe. Yeah, it is from Tarang Singh. Uh, he is asking, how did the hot dense ball at the start of the Big Bang? came into existence? Well, the, the, the question is difficult, answer is simple. And the answer is we do not know. Okay. Uh, but the reason the, the reason we do not know is, is interesting. Okay. And the reason is that uh, we know, we know the laws of nature as we observe them, right? However, we do not know what happens to these laws at very, very high gravitational fields. Now, when the that hot dense ball, as you say, it, uh, exploded in the in the very beginning, uh, the because the matter density was very very high, uh, it was uh, it is difficult to imagine what those laws would be. So what people do is they try to look for a theory which combines uh, quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, and gravity. Right now. This has proved to be a, a real challenge for all scientists to be able to combine uh, quantum mechanics and gravity, or quantum field theory and gravity. And that's the reason that at this point, nobody knows how that came into this. What people do is people have different theories about how it could have come into existence. And then we try to see if we can find some evidence to test those theories because only speculation is no use in science, right? You, you speculate, but then you also have to see whether you can observe something today which can give you any evidence. And till this point, we don't have any such thing, but there are many, many leads that people are working on. You would have heard of things uh, like uh, quantum gravity or what like string theory, for example, which uh, are things like inflation. These are the kind of uh, theories on which people are working on. Uh, but there is no definitive answer. Uh, next question is from Sohan. Uh, he's asking why is it so difficult to unify gravity along with all the other fundamental forces? Gravity just works very, very differently. Uh, but for example, once one simple thing that you realize it's no, we have positive and negative charges. We do not have positive and negative masses. 
Okay, so that's that's a very simple thing to see that uh, things actually behave differently. However, things are even even deeper than this. Uh, uh, even that uh, if I go slightly technical, so it turns out that there are certain symmetries that exist in electromagnetism. There are certain symmetries that exist in uh, strong interactions or weak interactions. We can even combine them. But it turns out that uh, in physics we find that the symmetry that we find in gravity are very, very different from the symmetry that we find in electromagnetism, for example. And uh, again, uh, people with uh, great people who have been stalwarts of uh, science and physics in 20th, 20th century and 21st century have been trying to do that, but they, they have simply not been able to do this. So clearly it's a very difficult problem. We can't hear you, Savan sir. We can't hear you. Oh, so sorry. Uh, this is question from Darya Shil. With all this recent success in physics, what would be your suggestion for research? Yeah. So, so perhaps as you figured out from, from what I what I said, uh, there are many unknowns, right? So all the results that I showed you uh, also gave rise to unknown things. Uh, what? The directions of research these days are the, are the directions that combine uh, multiple length scales, multiple energy scales, and multiple expertise. So, for example, uh, one theme that was there in two or three results I talked about today was what is called astroparticle physics, which is to try to understand what happens in astrophysics by, use, by using the knowledge of what happens in some nuclear physics. That was one way. Second way was to try to understand how elements are formed by looking at astrophysical phenomena. Okay. So this, this combines cosmology and particle physics, which were considered as completely different areas till about 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, another uh, area of research is being able to describe uh, condensed matter physics, which is the physics of materials, for example, by using mathematical techniques which are developed for understanding gravity. Uh, there are, uh, uh, there are, uh, let me give you an example. Okay, so the, let me just see what imagine is. So, see so today, in what I talked about today, I did not include them, but uh, maybe at some point of time. But for example, uh, we do not know what happened in the early stages of the universe. We do not know uh, what uh, gave rise to the fact that we see protons with a positively charged around which electrons with a negatively charged go and not the other way around. So we don't know why we do not have anti-protons, anti-hydrogen atoms, for example. Okay, it's a big question, never answered. We know, for example, that uh, the world, in the, in the universe that we observe, uh, only 4% Energy is the energy in atoms and molecules. Remaining 95, 96% is in the form of what is called as dark matter or dark energy, which we have not found. So it simply means that we have discovered only a tiny part of the universe that we currently understand about. And we just need to use whatever tools are at our disposal, including new technology, in order to go after questions that we feel curious about. So, uh, yeah, so it, it all depends on where your direction of curiosity is. One more question. Uh, is there a visiting program at TFR all around the year or only during the summer? So visiting during, program. So during the summer, we have a, a formal program, which is often called as Vis Visiting Student Research Program, VSRP. However, um, many people individually okay, might be able to offer you uh, research positions. Uh, 
for coming and working in their labs or working with them, for example. So what you could do is, of course, if you need some input from your end, just go to people's web pages because TFR will not centrally announce these things because everybody does them independently. But to go to TFR web page, usually every faculty member has their own web page in which they describe their research. And also if there are some opportunities of working with them. If you find that uh, somebody's uh, work actually interests you, do not feel shy. Just write to them anyway, introducing yourself and say that I would like to work with you in such and such topic. And uh, maybe uh, you might be able to be included in what they do. Uh, you have an advantage because you are in Mumbai, is that you could visit. I mean, of course, so hoping that this uh, COVID uh, passes us by very, very quickly. And once that is over, uh, the fact that you're able to travel to TIFR, you no, know, maybe a few times a week, depending on no, when you have when you are, do, not, do not have your college. Uh, you have an advantage that you can come here many times and no, maybe one or once or twice a week, actually come and work with people. This has been happening for many, many years. I think COVID gave us uh, this compulsory break, but uh, please, whenever this uh, pandemic gets over and you're able to travel, contact people from TIFR. Many of us are uh, quite happy to answer your questions and also call you and involve you in uh, the kind of research. Thank you. Uh, sir, I have a question of uh, my own. Uh, sir, why there are no massless fermions? Uh, we don't know. In fact, uh, it is not ruled out that there are massless fermions. So there can be massless fermions. In fact, it is possible that among the, the three neutrinos that we see, one of them may be massless. So there is no fundamental reason why there cannot be massless fermions. So it is, it is possible to have a Thank you, sir. So are there any other questions from students? I think uh, okay. not, uh, I mean, I think no. Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, question from Sohan again. Mm -hmm. Is it necessary to have a formal background knowledge in a particular field of the professor we wish to work with? See, of course, it is It is unlikely that you will know everything that is needed for working with the professor. But no, when you approach the person, they will most likely tell you what is it that uh, what what kind of reading you should do before coming and looking at uh, and, and joining the course? Okay. So uh, the formal background, I think, no. Whatever you are doing in your BSc or MSc of physics is, of course, your your formal background. Beyond that, what is needed for each kind of research is very different. So uh, do not be again uh, do not be shy approaching someone because you don't have the formal knowledge. You can actually ask, for example. Uh, what what it is that I should read before coming and uh, trying to work with you. And then learn and you know, read on that topic. So in research, very often you don't know everything to start with. You keep on learning things as uh, as as and when you need. Okay, I think there are no more questions. Uh, Mukdama, over to you, I think. Uh, Savan, sir. You you can continue for vote of thanks and then do. Okay. 
So we have arrived at the last session of this wonderful talk by Dr. Amul Dige. It was very illuminating. It was very informative, and I think it is uh, it motivated students uh, to think about certain phenomena the, on which they want to work. I mean, you covered start from the new unit philosophy to the observation of black holes to multi messenger astronomy and neutrino detection. So I think you covered all the powers of tense uh, in your uh, this lecture. Uh, the takeaway from this lecture would be uh, even if uh, we know for a certain accuracy the various constants, we have to keep on measuring because when we measure certain quantity, we are sure about the theory for that particular time. Okay, if there is a discrepancy, there should be some kind of a mechanism that is going on, which may affect or which will give rise to a new theory. And I uh, think that uh, this lecture uh, will uh, tell students that science is not a stagnant thing. It is not a final truth, but it is a, say, a, a way in which you seek the truth. Thank you once again, uh, Dr. Uh, Amol Dike for your illuminating talk. And uh, I think we can stop here. Thank you, sir. I just want to say, I mean, tell to participants that I have uh, sent a link uh, for the feedback form of the lecture. So please uh, fill, uh, fill the feedback form using the link given in the chat box. And I think uh, the, our session is, we are ending over here. So participants can leave. Hello, Shubhada ma'am. Yes, 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 